Welcome to another Dragonland Saga review episode. It is Misham New Cult the 13th. My name is Adam, and today I'm going to give you my spoiler-filled review of The Legend of Huma. Now, this was authored by uh, Richard A. Knack, right? Knack? Nake? Knack? I think it's Knack. Anyway, this is a beloved volume that is really, really old. But if for some insane reason you have yet to read it and do not want to be spoiled by it, don't watch this video. <laughs> Go do something else. Play pinball. Did people do that still? <laughs> that was when I grew up. Pinball was a thing. All right. Um, I'd like to thank the members of this channel uh, and invite you to consider becoming a member of this YouTube channel. And of course, because this is my spoiler-filled review, I like having engagement and interaction with you. <laughs> so if you happen to be tuning in live, well... I would appreciate you throwing any comments or thoughts in the chat. And then after I've read my pre-written review, we can just sort of riff a little bit. And we'll have a little bit of fun. It's Thursday. Got nothing else going on. Book of Boba Fett was released yesterday, and you've already seen that. So let's do this. All right, here we go. We are introduced to Huma and the political state of affairs of the Knights of Salamnia immediately. Huma is sent on a mission with Renard, his immediate commander, and they rout some goblins in a des uh, desolate town in Salamnia. There are, are a lot of towns like this near the front line of battle between the Queen of Darkness, <laughs> between the Dark Queen's forces and the Knights of Salamnia. They battle some goblins, and Huma is separated from his squad. He comes across goblins torturing a minotaur, and with concealment from uh, in the mists, he rescues the minotaur Kaz. Now, Kaz killed his slaver, Ogres, in the east, and says he owes Huma his life. This is a lot like Chewbacca's life debt to Han Solo, and their relationship is also very similar. But, as a Star Wars fan, I don't mind. They try to return to Huma's knights and come across a group of diseased and recently pillaged villagers who choose to attack Kaz in an act of vengeance. Huma tries to intervene, but it is a silver dragon that prevents the battle. And it offers Huma and Kaz a ride back to Huma's unit. On the way, they see a squad of dragons flying towards them, searching for Magius, and the dragon has them uh, jump off of her, but Huma stays on and fights Krynus, Tachesis' warlord and leader of the Black Guard, her elite troops. Now, on his, uh, he was on his Black Dragon char. Huma wounds Krynus in the back severely, and rather than the other dragons coming to kill them, they safely guard and ret the, the retreat of Krynus. Slamnik Knights ride up, and it ends up being Renard and Huma's squad. They bicker over Kaz, but ultimately accept Huma's word about Kaz, and all ride to the front lines, which is shifted in their absence. The Silver Dragon leaves, and as they ride further, they see a battle ongoing and join in. In the battle, Huma is knocked from his horse and trampled. He wakes up, and a half-elf-ish woman named Gwyneth, the silver dragon in disguise, is caring for him. After a few days of healing, Huma is assigned as captain of the Night Watch. On his rounds, he sees a missing post and enters into the forest alone, only to be confronted and attacked by a renegade mage who says Krynus would be happy to have him and that he's not the one that they're looking for. Huma kills him as Magius, his childhood friend, reveals himself, saying that the dreadwolves Huma was, uh, had seen and the wizard are from Galen Dracos, Tachesis' renegade wizard leader. So we have Galen Dracos and Krynus as the two sort of uh, big bad guys on behalf of Tachesis right now. Magius leaves, believing that the evil will follow him, and Huma is brought up on charges for dereliction of duty. Love military <laughs> realities. He is uh, cleared and sent to rest. The camp is attacked by wizards using military and elemental magic. The wizards attacked, uh, attached to the knights try to ward off the spells, but eventually fail as the knights retreat from the onslaught. Kaz and Huma wander through the storm and are summoned by Magus' light, who then takes them secretly to his citadel in Ergoth. I really love how this story is one told as a legend from the Dragonlance Chronicles, and the Citadel is built from legend, possibly Ire to Ogre construction from legend. The layers of ancient history is what makes Dragonlance feel so lived in and fantastical. I absolutely love it. So Magus tries to explain things to Huma, and the Citadel is assaulted by Krynus and his dragons and dreadwolves. Magus sends Huma and Kaz away, and they split up to divide 
those chasing after them. Huma eventually fights his way away and rides his mount to exhaustion as he faces off many enemies in a rage and defeats all of them. He stumbles for days through the forest and comes to a deserter who he chased into an Argothian knight's camp. Their leader, Lord Guy Avondale, out of Durendi, a cleric of Paladine in disguise, or just not admitting to it as of yet, invites Huma into his camp and cares for him for a few days on the way to Kergoth. Huma tells him of secret of the mountains to the southwest. Uh, ultimately, Magus told Huma about some powerful uh, weapon in the southwestern mountains that no one has ever seen but can turn the tide of the battle. It's the Dragon Lances. Spoiler alert. I would warned you, though. I told you it was coming. Um... And so he tells that you know, there's this weapon in the Southwest Mountains and uh, Lord Avondale's like, don't go there. No one returns from there. So Huma's uh, ambushed by the cult of Morgan while he's wandering the ruins in Karagoth and is given the plague, only discover that he's been marked for protection by someone at some unknown time. Turns out his birth. This mark saved his life as Avondale rides in with warriors and kills the cult leaders. Huma is whisked away by mages, and they end up in a, uh, by a lake where a nymph is trying to lure Huma to her, her watery home as her other bow comes in, another Knight of Salamnia. <laughs> Huma just escapes the Ergothian army in order to come right back into more Knights of Salamnia, and there's always a woman in every Dragonlance story that is like the sign of darkness. And in this case, the nymph plays that sort of role. He's like, I, I, you know, I want to be your sexual uh, uh, toy, or I want you to be my sexual toy. Come into the water with me. And Huma's like, I really don't got time. <laughs> I'm sorry. And I kind of have this thing for this girl who healed me. She smells like a dragon. I can't figure it out, but I kind of dig her. And I'm not really into nymphs. Anyway, Huma is met by Boron, the other knight of Salamnia. Uh, from a nearby outpost of Salamnic Knights, and they all travel together and are allowed to stay when the outpost knights capture Kaz. There's a trial, and Kaz is released to Huma. Magus, Huma, and Kaz travel to the mountains and are split up. Huma comes to the Dragon Mountain, where he meets Gwyneth. She... Here's another thing that I want to kind of... I didn't write down in my notes, but I, I wanted to bring it up. The Dragon Mountain... I was always led to believe that it was built as, you know, the God's version um, of Huma's tomb. But no, it's way more ancient than that. I read this when I was a kid, so some of this stuff is, is kind of fresh because I just forgot it over the past 30 years. Um, and that the, the, the history of the Dragon Mountain is one of those things that I just totally forgot about. She tells him that he must go through three trials. His first is to face off against Wormfather. The first dragon to answer to Kisis' calls in the first dragon war. Kira Joloth was the only one who could best him and imprison him in the mountain for millennia. The dragon asks Huma to get him out, and Huma tricks him into giving him information about a magic mirror in the worm's hoard. As the dragon comes to kill Huma, he picks up a malevolent magic sword and is swallowed by the worm only long enough to thrust it into his head from the inside. He's immediately spit out, starts thinking about Vingard Keep, and is literally transported there as he falls to the mirror. He's welcomed into the keep where the Grand Master has died of a plague. Lord Oswald is going to be contested by Bennett for the vacant position until Renard is discovered by Huma as a traitor and agent of Morgan. Renard, oh, here's another thing. I really love how they gave more gods than just Paladine and Tachesis an opportunity to shine in this story. Morgan doesn't play a huge role, but he plays a pivotal role through Renard, um, and ultimately, you know, for Huma. Renard reveals that he is Huma's uncle, and that his father, Durak, uh, who he marked for Morgan, which is how he's marked, uh, marked, was holding a pass and lost his life. Renard killed Huma's mother and brought him into the knighthood, and here's something that is on par with Lord Soth. He straight up murdered his best friend's wife and didn't even tell his son. No one knew about it. Like, if anyone deserves to be a death knight, Renard deserves to be a death knight. That's messed up. I mean, it's not like allowing, you know, turning your back on the cataclysm evil of Lord Soth or watching your own wife and infant burn to death in front of you, but it's not that far from it either.
Just saying. Um, Bennett came in and chased Renard off. He apologized to Human and thanks him for unmasking his father's murderer. Lord Oswald recovers and is named Grand Master. Human leaves to find the Dragon Mountain again to complete the trials and comes across Renard in a village sowing distrust. He defeats Renard by not killing him, which is important to Huma's character, but then Renard slits his own throat after having abandoned Morgan. Huma gives in, actually after Morgan abandoned Renard. Huma gives in to his emotions, and when he opens his eyes, he sees himself back in the treasure room of the Worm Father, questioning whether any of that took place for a bit. He begins to long for the sword that he used to kill the Worm Father, and realizes that Worm Father is now solid dragon metal. The sword appears next to his feet, and Huma gives the malevolent power, uh, gives in to the malevolent power of the sword. It is much like the power of the One Ring in Lord of the Rings. This is a theme that we're going to see from time to time. He's prevented from leaving the chamber by a gray robed figure, and as the sword battles with Huma's will, Huma finally overcomes its influence and throws it down. The robed figure hides the sword and allows Huma to proceed, revealing he completed the three tests. He defeated Wernfather then Renard, and resisted the Sword of Tears, the very sword that corrupted the original Ire to Ogres. You didn't have to throw that in, Richard Knack, but you did, and I love that. There is so much about this that ties in ancient Age of Starbirth history to this Age of Dreams history, and in comparison to Age of Despair, which we all had read before reading this, in most cases, it just adds layer upon layer of just this wonderful, rich world. It's so great. Huma approaches the smithy and encounters Duncan Ironweaver, who takes him to the Hall of Dragonlances. A dragon and knight gifts Huma the Dragonlance, and Huma collects the 20 total lances and discovers a secret entrance to leave through. Now, here's a couple things that I have a problem with. There's only 20 dragon lances until he needs more than 20 dragon lances. And then it realizes, it's revealed that no, there was actually a whole lot more, hundred more, except that Duncan didn't think that Huma needed them and Huma didn't notice them. How oddly convenient. <laughs> Give me a break. And they're just delivered, which all of this could have just been delivered in the same manner in which it was delivered later in the story. I don't know why they go through all these ridiculous back and forth uh, storytelling tropes, and I'm going to get into some more here in a little bit. So, as he emerges, Gwyneth appears and tells him that his friends are waiting and that she will help transport the lances. Kaz and Magus are fighting, and Kaz reveals that Magus was using Huma to kill Wormfather for the dragon lances, as he saw that he would die by trying it himself. I don't see this at all. I didn't put this in my writing, but it's a note. That wasn't a, a betrayal. I don't see how anyone could ever conceive of that as a betrayal. If you, if anyone knows anything about the test of the high sorcery, it makes you face things that are horrible. You are literally forging your soul with magic. That's the whole point. You're supposed to forsake everything except for magic. That's how you know you're worthy. So to expect a, a, a wizard who passed the test of high sorcery to... Think of his friend over his magic is insane and belies all understanding of the Wizards of High Sorcery. Of course, Kaz probably wouldn't know that, so you can't blame Kaz, but from a storytelling element, you can't really expect us as the reader to look down on Magus when we just went through Raceland Majir, <laughs> and he was way worse. So, I mean, he abandoned his friends in the Blood Sea in the maelstrom of the Blood Sea. His brother, his twin brother. <laughs> so Mage is being like, hey, I'm still going to do what I need to do to save the world. I'm just going to use my friend, the hero Knight of Salamnia to do it. That's not a betrayal. That's thinking on your feet. Like, that's, that's good planning. All right. Anyway, uh, Huma accepts the truth of Magus' test of the Order of High Sorcery and forgives Magus. For what? I don't know. I still can't figure it out personally. The Silver Dragon appears and takes Huma while Kaz and Magus transports the Dragon Lances with a wagon back to Vanguard Keep. In route, they come across Boron, who waited for Huma and who wants to join them. Huma is attacked by two red dragons with Black Guard riders. They kill one, and Krynus, 
riding Char, kills the other so that he can face Huma in solo combat. The dragons take a lot of damage, but Huma does enough to kill Char with the dragon lance, and as it falls, Krynus leaps from the dragon and falls, smiling at Huma. As the silver dragon crashes, Huma walks, uh, wakes and finds it gone and is suddenly attacked by Krynus. Krynus reveals that he's immortal and cannot die. Super creepy scene where Huma takes his head off and Krynus is just looking for his head. It's like the wound seals up. This is very Headless Horseman here. Just super creepy and cool. And the, the reaction of Gwyneth when she sees this headless corpse is perfect. She's just like, oh my gosh! And incinerates him with her fire. It was it was hilarious. I just love that scene. Because it is genuinely horrid. Like, what we, no one's seen anything like that. You see zombies, but Krynus isn't a zombie. He's just immortal. Another story that reminds me of uh, Death Becomes Her. A great comedy. I think it was from the 80s, but Bruce Willis, come on. You can't get better than that. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Galen Dracos, uh, I'm sorry, they race to the wagon to battle the Black Guard forces who are trying to seize the Dragon Lances, purportedly. Galen Dracos opens a portal to his keep, and as the knights, Kaz, and Mages battle, Mages is actually captured and taken to the portal. I personally think Mages was the point of that, not the Dragon Lances, but Huma didn't know that, and to that point, no one knew that Huma had Dragon Lances. No one even knows what the hell a Dragon Lance is. Okay. Saddened by driven, uh, but driven by purpose, Huma delivers the Dragon Lances and is praised as a hero by the Grand Master and other knights. They want to create fake lances to scare dragons that they will fly against, but the knights refuse to entertain the idea as they have no faith in them. This brings up a point of a story, the story that Taz promised he would never tell, and one of you telling me that that made sense because it was laid, the groundwork for it was laid here. No, it wasn't. There was no groundwork. The men, the knights did not want to use fake lances because they wouldn't work, and then they end up using real lances, so they did work. So the idea of just having faith in a dragon lance is what gives the dragon lance power is a lie. That was never a thing. Not in this novel, not in any game book, not in anything ever at all until that story was written. And it's really frustrating because it just shines the light that that story still sucks even more. And all it does is devalue the very thing that this entire campaign world is named after. I didn't understand it at all. It was weird. Okay. They give up the ruse and 20 knights and dragons fly as darkness descends on the keep. They arise, arrive at the portal to the abyss being opened by a renegade mage and battle and kill many of them, closing the portal. Uh, Galen appears before Huma, revealing the dragons form, uh, revealing the dragons from all over Kryn coming to aid Tachesis. Huma orders the knights to fall back to the keep and sees a black robe mage summoning him. He offers the black robe's aid to Huma and Huma accepts and the orb... Uh, the orb that he's going to give to him, which will reveal Galen's tower and allow Huma to fight Tachesis. He returns to Vingard Keep to share... One thing I, I got to say about this, I, I love Huma because he is not this invincible hero. He is getting his ass handed to him over and over again in this novel. He is not a super badass. He's just a knight who believes in the knighthood. And that's something that is so rare throughout all of the history of the Knights of Salamnia that it's worth writing a book over and creating a legend from. Like, there, there's something genuinely magical about that. Like, he, he's not John McClane, you know? I mean, arguably, they're probably exactly the same type of anti-hero, you know? Because he's going against what seems like the regular order of knights, even though Lord Oswald has all faith in them. Uh, Bennett didn't until the very end. Um, all the other knights are building up legends around him as he's going through his life. I don't know. Pretty cool. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm just, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm rambling, uh, rambling here. The dragon hordes and evil armies of the Dark Queen are approaching and they mount up to join the first wave. Huma is wounded in the ferocious battle and is brought back to the rear for treatment. Gwyneth is forced to reveal herself by the knights who saw her transform from Huma's mount to her humanoid form, and she begins to share her love of him, and Galen Dracos appears and murders Magus in front of Huma in order to demoralize him. He does not know Huma. <laughs> if 
It only emboldens Yuma, and they take to the skies again to find Dracos's castle. In route, the Black Robes rebel against the Renegade wiz Wizards, and Huma and his Silver Dragon fly down to the Citadel, only to be knocked out of the air by the Black Robes in order to save Huma from Dracos' security measures. Huma meets up with the Black Robes in the Citadel and heads to Dracos' chamber to find him, instructing Kyan Bloodbane. I forgot this part too! I totally forgot! Again, Richard Neck, you don't have to add Kyan Bloodbane to this, but I love that you did. Now, what I... I don't really like is that I know you guys say Cyan. You don't have to deal with it. Cyan is obsessed with the elves. 100% all day long. I would like to know why. I don't remember it ever explicitly saying other than the dragon orb called to him and then he manipulated Lorak. Why, why does he have such a hard on for all of the elves? It doesn't make any sense. Like Galen Dracos taught him, and it explicitly states, taught him about humans, dwarves, and elves, and ogres, and everything else. So, why is he so obsessed just with the elves? It was Raislin, actually, it was Fist and Danilus, through Raislin, that beat him, not the elves. It was Mina, a god who ultimately had him killed by the elves, actually, but then it doesn't matter, because he's dead. So, why... Maybe you guys can let me know, because I can't remember. Um, <laughs> already you guys are correcting me. Galen dismissed Kyan and uh, Huma sees Tachesis in the orb and the black robes uh, that the black robes gave him. It really started to feel like Lord of the Rings at this point to me. We had a lot of similar connections thus far, and I'm really seeing... Every time I hear Galen Dracos' name, or I, I read it on the page, I see a ring wraith. I can't help it. That's exactly what Galen Dracos has conjured in my mind every single time I think of him. He's, he's a ring wraith. Like, I can't... He's not even mortal. Like, he's getting energy by destroying other living things. So it's not like he was this human that just became powerful. Because he didn't really look human. He looked like lizard-like or something. So, I don't know. For, for whatever reason, I just... That's how I see him. Tachesis is very much like Sauron in this. Like... Her power, she even comes through an orb to spy on the hero, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's very Lord of the Rings. There's a lot of things. That sword early on was the ring. I don't know. Everything is ultimately derivative in fantasy of Lord of the Rings. I get that. But do you have to get so close to it? If this has flaws, those are the flaws for me. Galen traps Huma with a gargoyle and begins opening a portal to the abyss for Tachesis to enter through. Huma is reminded of the Staff of Magus, and, and it appears in his hand, and he frees himself with it. Alright, this whole shrinking down to like a tiny little stick. Okay, it's a magical staff. Do whatever it wants. But how is a dude who doesn't know how to use magic using it? That doesn't make sense to me. Like, when it's like a quarter staff and he's like Donatelloing these guys, the statues, I get that. He's a warrior. <laughs> but, like, actually using it to, like, I don't know, magically destroy the gargoyles and have it ex elongate and stuff. That seems like it should be like a magic user thing, not a, not a nice Salamia thing. Anyway. Then he hurls the orb at Galen, uh, the staff at Galen. And uh, actually doesn't even try to hit Galen. He tries to hit the orb. And the orb shatters. And it, it, then it like magically returns to Huma's belt. Which I guess now it's like the device of time journeying. He was never formally gifted. I understand he was given this. The, he, like mages just left it behind for Huma to find. Hoping Huma would find it. That's not really giving the staff to him. That's Huma finding the staff. The way I see it. But I forgive it because it's just a book, right? It's just a novel. It's a fantasy story. A little fantasy is okay. He shouldn't be able to use the damn staff. It's magical. You can't use magic staves. Maybe you can. I don't know. Uh, green flame erupts and the silver dragon comes to aid Huma. Now, Galen Dracos obliterates himself rather than face to Kesis for his failures. Okay, like, I get people are afraid of her wrath, so you're gonna kill him, right? This is a vengeful-filled guy, this Galen Dracos. 
He has humor right in front of him. He is at his most powerful at this moment, having sucked in all the magical energy from everywhere. Why doesn't he just kill Huma right now? Like, he could literally obliterate Huma and then kill himself if that's what he wants to do. No, I don't want Huma to die. But if you're looking at the fundamental structure of the story, he wouldn't have, like, committed suicide. He would have killed Huma out of revenge for foiling his plot and then committed suicide. If he was going to commit suicide at all. Don't commit suicide, kids. Weird. I, it was just a point of disbelief I can't get past. It doesn't make any sense, and it's a huge flaw in this book for me. That being said, uh, it doesn't match the vengeful character that he presented thus far and effectively gets rid of the, one of the two big baddies in a wildly oversimplistic way. Huma and his dragon flee the eruption to see Takesis partially in the world. She's constantly trying to seduce him as Kaz and Bennett fly in on their dragons. Huma gives the staff of mages to Bennett and tells him to lead the resistance and delivers the staff and news of Dracos' death to the Order of High Sorcery. Kaz joins Huma to hold the Dark Queen off until Bennett can bring more dragons in. Kaz is buffeted by winds, uh, wind attacks from Takesis and is forced to take refuge in land with his dragon as Huma and Gwyneth face off against the Dark Queen themselves. They struggle with the battle and decide to sacrifice themselves to kill her. He lodges the dragon lance into the Dark Queen and Gwyneth succumbs to her attacks and falls from the sky, bringing Huma with her and breaking the dragon lance inside Takesis. Huma miraculously wakes in agony with broken bones and probably a healthy amount of internal bleeding. He crawls to the uh, polymorphed Gwyneth and professes his dying love for her. She gives him the footman's lance and dies. I don't feel like enough weight was put on Huma at this moment. I feel like he should have reacted more despairingly, more... I understand he, he is, the strength of Huma is that he doesn't dwell on things. He's, he's a soldier. He has a mission to accomplish. He has to defeat the Dark Queen. So he's like, I love you so much. I've always loved you. I'm terribly sorry for not saying that earlier. I gotta kill this lady. I'm sorry. You understand, right? I'll be back. And then he, like, crawls over. I Like, I get the character. I like drama. I want that moment of him holding her and just shouting, like, Why, Tachesis? And then gently laying her down with now filled with vengeance in his heart to go kill that bitch who killed his girl. That's what I wanted. Didn't get it. He crawls to the ledge of the cliff, below which is the death dark, um, <laughs> the dark queen dying and pleading with Huma for help. He's attacked and falls to a lower level. Now, nearly dead. Now, here's the other thing. How much punishment can this dude take? Like, I, I said earlier that he was not invincible. At this point, he's in full plate mail armor. He fell from who knows how high, landed will give him justice on the dragon which still would hurt and so he's all broken and bleeding and then he falls down another cliff to the dark queen and he's still alive enough to actually bargain with her come on come on anyway it's a story. <laughs> he forces the queen to leave the mortal realm for good and if she does he will have the lance removed he clearly can't do it himself because he's broken and twisted and dying so Kaz arrives and Huna tells him that he must remove the lance and Kaz doesn't want to do it. But because he loves Huma, because he owes Huma his life, he does. And the Dark Queen leaves and Huma dies. Here's another point that I wanted more time with. Huma is the central character of this entire story. I want a last dying moment to at least be more than a sentence between Kaz and Huma. I want there to be that moment where Kaz, like, drops the broken lance, comes over, and, you know, the, the, the Queen of Darkness already left. The, the dragons are flying in to, you know, defeat the Dark Queen because they don't know that she left yet. And he's looking down at his best friend in the world at this point, a hero who faced a god and actually banished the god himself, and just to have a moment and cry. Just pick him up in his arms and turn and start walking into the sunset. Like, I want that moment. And I didn't get shit. <laughs> kind of bugged me. All right. We end the novel with the knights building a garish shrine for Huma and Kaz leaving to wander Kryn on his own terms. Like, like uh, Kung Fu or something. 
Now, this was an epic story that, despite its many flaws, is still powerful, emotional, exciting, and very much a must-read. I would highly recommend this for anyone who loves fantasy, epic tales, and, of course, Dragonlance. All right, so what do you guys think? That's the end of my review. Holy crap, you guys got a lot of stuff. Um, JC Galvaniel, thanks for joining live. That is awesome that that's the first Dragonlance book you ever read. It's a great place to start. It is a really good novel. Uh, Scam Assassin. <laughs> Welcome. Good to see you. Trees 90, this used to be one of your favorites. You read it like five to six times. Must be like 15 years since you read it last. Yeah, I forgot a lot of things. I only read it once um, back in the day, but I enjoyed it then. I, I enjoyed it much more now. Even though I know I complain a lot, I still loved it. Um, I thought Lord Avondale was super cool. Like, there's this... One thing that I really love is, is socio-political drama and, and conflict. I know there's a lot of it in our real world. Why would you want more in a story? But the strength of Kryn are the different political factions, even when they seem like they should be on the same side. Now, the timeline that we're in, there's not a huge span of time between when Knights of Salamnia broke off from Aragoth, or when Salamnia broke off from Aragoth. So there's still like that sort of historical bad blood between them. But Lord Avondale's a pragmatist, and I love that about him. He's like, look, my emperor's a punk, and he doesn't care about his people, he doesn't care about his armies, he doesn't care about anything. He is off playing Nintendo all day, and we're left out here defending his realm. So I'm going to help you out because it's the right thing to do. That's awesome. It would be so easy for him to be like, no, I'm going to take the side of my emperor. And he said to kill you and take your weapons. So I'm going to do that. And he could have, but he didn't. That's what's great about this is that even though there's these established um, political norms and, and even directives, the, on the, the ground level, the human beings involved are able to make the letter of the law call rather than, I'm sorry, the spirit of the law call rather than the letter of the law. And I think that is so incredibly important because if there's one huge flaw in all of Dragonlance, it's that good guys are not good, they're stupid. All of them. Every single ooh, <laughs> good guy is a dumbass. They always work against their self-interest. They refuse to work with people who they just worked with even just a few years prior because of their established biases and bigotries and blatant racism. It doesn't make any sense. The good guys are super dumb, but you get people like Lord Avondale and you're like, okay, not all of them are dumb. That actually makes me feel good. <laughs> Sometimes a good guy can just be a good guy. All right. They're not all Derek crown guards. We should call them Derek's. Whenever you, whenever like a good guy is just a douche. Being a Derek. Check out this Derek over here. All right. So uh, <laughs> please review the King Priest trilogy. Oh, I definitely will, man. I love that trilogy. That was a good one too. Second favorite character, Benjamin. Thanks for joining live, man. You read the Dragonlance trilogy in high school. Sturm influenced you to join the U.S. Marine Corps. Sweet. I was in the army. Thanks for your service. Silverwolf, how are you doing? Thanks for joining live. Um, let's see here. Yeah, I just had a conversation with Margaret. She's a gem. She's super cool. You like the influence of Morgan and the other gods, trees? Yeah, I just thought it was so great. Because we don't really get that in any of the other ones. You know, it's like Mishakal or it's Paladine and Tachesis. And that's kind of it. It's cool to get other ones. Lord Soth just wanted to trade his wife for a new model. <laughs> He, he was waiting for the delivery from Aragoth. <laughs> Rendered as a death knight of Morgan in some dungeon would be fun. Yeah, dude. That'd be super dope. I might do that. I like that idea a lot. Knight with no mustache. Must be a villain. <laughs> Except for Gerard. <laughs> That's the other thing. is like I always love the trope of having the handlebar mustache. And that, that is the tradition of Knights of Slamia. Now you can have a full beard. You can have, be clean shaven. Are there no rules anymore? <laughs> I want to see this super patchy Knight of Salamnia who has like one or two really long hairs, probably out of like a mole, <laughs> but he can't really grow like a real good mustache, but he's trying real hard. <laughs> That'd be funny. All right. Uh, let's see. Can they make everything interesting? Yeah, they pretty much <laughs> and, and troublesome. Remember reading this during the teacher's college practicum? Really? 
Humans no anti-hero. Anti-heroes must be morally compromising. That's true. You're absolutely right, TMAT. Thank you for joining live, by the way. Uh, Michelle Hart. Hume is a Mr. H misunderstood hero and brilliantly done. Yes. Yeah, you're right. Love the kind part. Uh, learn from Dracos. That's so cool. Cayenne pepper. <laughs> Blood pain. <laughs> this foreshadows what Takesis' green head does. That's true. That's nice. A little touch I didn't pick up on. He's as spicy a dragon. <laughs> All right. What else? <clears throat> Gwyn is saying that all dragons can breathe fire except the cowardly whites. Grind your gears. <laughs> I thought it was a funny little dig. A totally unnecessary dig, but you can tell she's like, I don't like the white dragons. Like the other dragons I respect. I don't enjoy them. I don't appreciate them. I don't agree with them. But white dragons? Ugh. <laughs> it's funny. A, a Game of Thrones style ending would be like, um, Bernard or it would be Bennett I mean it would be Bennett coming in and being like I was going to be the Grandmaster all the while because like Lord um, Owen had died or Oswald died or something like that it would just be like this super wildly unsatisfying ending you're like but Bennett was a Derek I don't want Derek to be the Grandmaster um, Hume has way too many hit points <laughs> <laughs> for all those falls. That's funny. Uh, Warlock Gaming, thanks for joining live. You just finished the audiobook yesterday. Wow. You like it, but it felt lopsided. Uh, I felt like there was a lot of great characters left criminally underdeveloped. Um, I mean, we only have a handful of characters in this story. Like, meaningful characters, you know? So Galen Dracos is a bad guy. He's ended up being the ultimate bad guy, but we weren't led to believe that initially. Um, I thought he was great. I thought he really dumb at the end not to kill Huma. He totally could have done it. It makes no sense that he didn't. If 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 you spoiled my plans that I've been working for on behalf of the Queen of Darkness and my own personal power for however many 40 years, we'll say, and I had the power within me to enact revenge, I would totally do it. You're clearly evil. <laughs> like, I don't get why you don't do it. Kill him. Just kill him. Um... Let's see, Magius was underdeveloped. We don't know anything about his background. We don't know why he, he kept changing all the different colors of the rainbow of the Order of High Sorcery. I, I feel like I don't know anything about this guy who was supposed to be the second most powerful mage underneath Galen Dracos. It led me to believe he was a renegade, and then he was a member of the Red Robes, and then he was a member of the White Robes, and then he was killed. Like, what the hell's going on with this guy? Give me some info. And this staff that goes down to like a magician's make a bunny fly out of a hat wand and then full staff length and so you can just Donatello people? Like, what's up with this staff of mages? Because there's some stuff that Raceland didn't even figure out. <laughs> he never did that. I think that's kind of interesting. Um, Krynus as a warlord? just worthless like he was he was like a, it was it was almost comedic like i don't think it was supposed to be played for laughs but i think his like the end of him was definitely laughable like that's not scary at all he, he'd killed his own bad guys so that he could face off one and one because he has this where's this sense of honor come from he's an immortal bad guy he doesn't play fair he admits to it i don't it, the character just doesn't make much sense Char, we didn't get to know anything about him. Renard was pretty interesting, though I, I I would like a little bit more time in his head. We got a lot. We got a fair amount, enough to develop the character, but I'd like more. Kaz, I, you know, unless you read anything else with Minotaurs, you wouldn't really understand where he's coming from. Where does this sense of Minotaur pride come from? Because it's never really fully explained in this. It's just, it's straight out flatly said, they are an honorable people. But that's kind of it. Like, why? Wherefore? What? How? <laughs> and, and other Shakespearean freight turns of phrase. Um, Lord Oswald, I thought was great. The only dude who had Huma's back the whole time. I just love that. And, and Huma and Lord Oswald was very much like um, um, Sturm and... Uh... Oh, come on. Don't make me... 
I've got to pull it out here. It's Sturm and ba -ba -da -ba, Lord Gunther, Guntheroth Wistan. The, their relationship was very much mirrored between those. And I, I appreciate that. Gunther didn't really, you know, he liked Sturm. He always liked Sturm. You know, he gave him every chance that he possibly could. Same with Lord Oswald. So I don't know, is this just a trope or is it just something that happens? I know in my military career, I had some sergeants and some captains and lieutenants that, and commanders that really liked me and some that really didn't <laughs> for whatever reason. And so, you know, they'd go for bad at me. And so, yeah, it's just a sort of dynamic that naturally evolves. But I don't know. It felt kind of like a trope at this point. Um, Bennett, he's a Derek. <laughs> That's all. He's a Derek. Until the end when he's not a Derek. So he's a Derek reformed. Um, Lord Trake, we didn't learn anything about. The Dreadwolves, Gwyneth, still didn't really, I don't know. Like she said, she, Gwyneth said she lived a long time with other humans. And so she learned how to love like a human. Okay. Um, I don't know. <laughs> other than that, she's not really a character, you know? She does all these mystical, wonderful things because she's a dragon and she can because she's a dragon. But you don't really learn anything about her. Lord Guy Avondale, we don't know much about him, except it's revealed he's a, a cleric of Paladin, which is dope. He's super, like, rational as a human and as a uh, soldier, which I totally appreciate. Boron, who is, like, in love with the nymph. What was it? Was it Boron? Yeah. He was, like, in love with this nymph, or at least seemed to be, because he frequently visited her, which I don't know if nymphs wear clothing, but maybe that's where he was getting his loving in. That's what I'm suspecting. But then he's just like, he sees like a real knight and he's like, I must follow you <laughs> like a moth to a flame. He's like, Huma, I need you. Um, Lord Tagan was pretty dope. I liked him at the outpost. Wormfather was a story that, very strange. Like, I don't remember that at all in anything else. So is all the pool of dragon metal that they get later on uh, in the War of the Lands era, is that all Wormfather just melted down? <laughs> Are the dragon lances made from Wormfather? Uh, the Sword of Tears, I loved that as a, a story element. Love the history. Duncan Ironweaver, pretty awesome. Durak, uh, Huma's father, know nothing about him, but now I want to know everything about him. Why have we never heard about this last fatal stand that he gave his life for? I need to know more about this. Was he with Brightblade? No, because Brightblade was alone when he did it. It was very 300. I want to know about him. All right. Anyway, to your point, there are some underbelly characters. <laughs> there needs to be a movie. The whole time I'm watching this, I'm like, this should be a movie. This should be a trilogy. It's short enough and condensed enough that it can be a trilogy and developed out. If it was just one movie, they'd have to cut too much stuff and it wouldn't be good and you wouldn't be able to really develop out characters. But if it was a trilogy, then you could really dive into those characters and their motivations with a few back scenes or cut scenes or some dialogue to, to really expand on the already great novel, right? It could be amazing. And it's not stuck in the War of the Lance era and so it doesn't feel so familiar to people or it doesn't feel so busy. It's a very contained, tight story. The war's already happening. The queen is already coming into the world. So the, it's set up. Good guys, Knights of Slamnia. Bad guys, Galen Dracos and uh, Krynus. That's all you need. And then everything else is just exposition and backstory and it starts building out this world so that if you then want to do a War of the Lance, I perfectly think they should do a, a, a streaming series of the War of the Lands. Then you can do that and, and still have all the money like, you know, uh, Game of Thrones or something like that um, to be thrown at it so that it can really shine visually. But, but to start with a trilogy of this thing, I think would be perfect because it's close enough to that familiar, you know, like King Arthur vibe and, you know, the Lord of the Ring vibe that people are going to connect with it instantly because of those hero tropes. But it's also different enough to make them interested in this new world, which is clearly not new, of Dragonlance. So, I don't know. I think it would be a great stepping stone. With his mustache, strong heart, the paladin from the AD&D &D toy line seems like Nia Salamia. The only toy lines I remember as a kid were from the cartoon. Dungeons and Dragons cartoon. You guys remember that? <laughs> that was awesome. Uh, channel inspired you to reread all the books. That's awesome. Thanks, Victor Cruz, for joining, by the way. 
uh, I think that's great. I think these books, I'm having a lot of fun rereading all these books. They're, I mean, they're not all like gems or anything, you know, like literary masterpieces. And I'm, I'm intermixing other books, you know, between them. But they're great. I'm enjoying it. As a granddaughter of a World War II Air Forceman, I want to point out a tactical error, having some dragons fly low in case Huma Gwyneth descended. You always maintain a height advantage in the air. I don't know enough, but I'm going to take your word for it. And yeah, I mean, as far as dragons are concerned, you wouldn't want to be below. Because, I don't know, that just seems like a, a... First of all, if anyone's ever learned anything, it's that if you have the high ground, you can cut people's limbs off. So, and you can win every time. I have the high ground. So you always want the high ground, right? Another Star Wars reference. Strongheart was in an episode of the cartoon. Oh, is that who that was? Okay, well, that's all I had for this. Thank you guys so much for tuning in live. Uh, let me know what you think about this novel by Richard A. Knack, The Legend of Huma. Uh, do you enjoy the re reviews that I'm putting out here? What book do you want me to read next? I'm already planning on Cast the Minotaur. Feel free to email me at info at dlsaga.com or comment below. I'd like to take a moment and remind you to subscribe to this YouTube channel if you haven't already. Ring the bell and get notified about upcoming videos. Click the like button. It always helps. Uh, let other Dragonlance fans learn about this channel and we can all sort of geek out together <laughs> about this really wonderful saga. This channel is all about celebrating the wonderful world of the Dragonlance saga. Thank you so much for joining me on the celebration. My name's Adam. Until next time, Slon Javar. <laughs>